Howdy, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lars Schall. I am an independent financial journalist from Germany, and I am now connected with energy consultant Dr. Karin Kneisel in Vienna. Grüß Gott, Frau Kneisel. Grüß Gott and good morning, sir. <laughs> Uh, we want to talk about the crisis in the Ukraine and more specifically about the economic sanctions that come into play. What are those sanctions? Uh, the sanctions are manifold and we have seen so far a series of uh, three different uh, stages. The first one was in response to the annexation of the Crimea Peninsula, which were fairly toothless sanctions uh, concerning uh, more or less a list of certain persons who were not supposed to travel anymore uh, to the EU. And then we saw <clears throat> two uh, uh, next rounds of sanctions, one concerning uh, more financial activities, such as denying access uh, to Russian big companies to the U.S. bond market uh, and uh, uh, credit services, etc. Uh, the third step was then a major one, namely the one of uh, 13, uh, third, um, end of July, I think it was uh, 29th, 30th of July, when the uh, European Union decided a, a major list of sanctions, which also for the first time um, had a massive um, uh, impact on energy relations between the European Union and uh, the Russian Federation. And in that regard, the EU followed uh, in many um, ways uh, the US sanctions, namely um, uh, stopping the transfer of technology and material Uh, when it comes to oil exploration. Now, the European Union members were, were very happy. So I, I spoke to some Austrian diplomats who said, yes, we could, uh, we could make sure that uh, the gas sector was not affected. But if one uh, takes a step back and thinks about it twice, any kind of material and a lot of technology that you use in oil exploration is also used for gas exploration. So, Uh, the, uh, the, the, the argument is not really convincing that the gas sector so far has not been affected. And um, in response to those sanctions, then Russia started to take certain measures, which came as a certain surprise to the West, uh, such as uh, stopping the import of agricultural products. We are now about uh, to enter a fourth stage of sanction, as German Chancellor Angela Merkel has announced yesterday, Those sanctions which were decided by the European Council and by the ambassadors in, in Brussels last Friday, but not yet put into force, not yet published, these sanctions should come on, on track um, as soon as possible, according to Chancellor Merkel. And there we, are, uh, we, we should expect also a major, maybe even a sort of asymmetric response by the Russians, which could include uh, like uh, stopping... Uh, Uh, airline transits to Russian airspace and even um, a certain response in, 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 in the gas sector. Yeah, when it comes to energy, what is there to expect? Well, there is ex to expect, I would say, first of all, um, an inner Ukrainian problem. Uh, as far as I have observed the crisis of 2006 and 2009, it was less uh, a dilemma between Uh, Moscow and the West, but it was much more uh, a quagmire within uh, the Ukraine, different forces which ended uh, finally, especially in 2009, uh, in stopping the delivery of Russian gas through Ukraine. And when I listened to the announcements by Prime Minister Azeny Yasenyuk and the debate within the Ukrainian parliament of mid of August, end of August, where they announced inter alia to put Gazprom on a certain list, to stop dealing with Gazprom in any way, and asking also the European Union importers to buy gas as of now direct at the Ukrainian eastern border with Russia and not anymore at the Ukrainian western border. Uh, this, this, uh, this could have a major impact, and I wouldn't be surprised if... Uh, Stopping of transit of Russian gas through Ukraine uh, would be done by the Ukrainians, for instance, uh, because there is a very harsh winter, because they couldn't fill their gas storages, as they have announced. They're, they're still missing several billions of cubic meters to really fill them to get through the winter somehow. So the, uh, uh, the, the, the risk the, the, the of, of really covering the storage and uh, enabling Russian gas to transit uh, Ukraine um, is not solved. 
uh, will those sanctions that will come into play related to the energy sector have consequences for the European energy policy? Well, uh, first of all, I might say I haven't seen so far uh, something that you can really call a policy, a European energy policy, because uh, w when you look at the, uh, at the various norms and, and directives of the European Union, uh, it's mostly, uh, it mostly concerns the inner European market and there it comes to competition. Uh, for instance, just to take a catchword, unbundling, which also affects the, the entire South Stream project. So it's all about competition. But since the EU member states are very much dependent on imports and uh, every EU member state can run its import strategy, can run its energy mix the way it decides, so that remains within national competence. Uh, and we are still a far cry away from something like an energy union. Uh, the new Commission President uh, Juncker has announced yesterday his uh, his team, and uh, we also have now a Vice President for creating the Energy Union. But I wonder whether this really will come into action in in, in the foreseeable time. So far, every EU member state run its own energy mix has a very different uh, uh, form of dependence on Russian gas. When you take a country like uh, Hungary, Slovakia. Um, both EU member states since 2004, uh, they are 100% dependent on Russian gas imports. When you take a country like France or Portugal, the situation is completely different. Uh, Austria is dependent on Russian gas to an extent of about 70%, Germany around 30%. So uh, the dependence is, is, um, is varying. Would you say in general that Europe is about to shoot in its own foot? Of course, <laughs> and that several times at, uh, <laughs> at the same time. Uh, because uh, uh, actually since 2006, 2009, when the f uh, we, we all spoke about diversification and the, 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 the big diversification measure that was taken was uh, to build Nord Stream, namely to circumvent uh, difficult transit countries like um, Ukraine. Uh, but uh, apart from uh, changing the routes, um, the, the, the various efforts to, to diversify, and I mean here diversify not only in the, in the sense of with whom uh, do you conclude contracts for import, uh, but also how you organize your entire energy mix. There, uh, a lot has been announced, but little has been done. Does Europe see itself um, as too important as an energy market? Yes, we, we have always had a tendency to overestimate our own importance and uh, we, I mean, we, we are not anymore in, 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 the, in the early 1900s when we were still the important, demographically speaking, uh, because we were a major part of world population, technologically speaking, and that means also as, as a market for products, as a producer, we are a far cry away from the importance we once had. Uh, but uh, a certain Eurocentric mentality still runs our minds and uh, uh, the world has turned east and that is a, a movement that, that didn't start <coughs> sorry that didn't start a few months ago but that has been on its way for at least 25 years and uh, we speak now a lot about uh, the Obama administration looking more to the Asia Pacific region but this was a measure that uh, the earlier Bush administration, George Herbert Bush, uh, already announced in the mid-1980s. And if there hadn't been uh, uh, the 1989 events, breakdown of the Berlin Wall, etc., maybe the United States would already be sitting much more in the East and the entire transatlantic business alliance, etc., would be marginal. Uh, but that uh, business, uh, demography, um, technology markets are turning east. I think this is a major uh, development. And here, uh, if I may add on that note, um, although the Russians have understood that quite a long while ago, um, if I call, I, I think I recall correctly that one of the major misunderstandings between Vladimir Putin and uh, Michael Khodorkovsky, his big uh, antagonist uh, ever since 2003, when Khodorkovsky wanted to merge his company, Yukos, with a major uh, U.S. oil producer. He was arrested. His, his company was destroyed. 
But uh, one of the, the many, many elements that caused uh, that um, animosity between the two men was that Khodorkovsky wanted to turn east and Khodorkovsky was convinced that China was the future market, uh, while Putin in those days was fairly reluctant because China and Russia are not natural allies. Uh, they had been at, at odds for, for decades. Uh, they, they share a long border and uh, there are also many reasons to be suspicious of each other. But in the meantime, also Putin uh, has turned more and more east, and we have seen uh, the East Siberia Pacific Ocean pipeline going online in 2011. We see now the new gas pipeline, uh, Power of Siberia, and this is just uh, the oil and gas business. But apart from that, there is a Sino-Russian cooperation uh, that goes beyond energy. One question that arises for Europe is um, the issue or the question if it wants to be dependent on Russian gas or if it wants to de be dependent on the hype of fracking in the U.S. What is your opinion about this? Well, uh, the U.S. and Canada have uh, announced uh, ever since early spring, don't worry about Russian gas, we can deliver to you U.S. and Canadian shale gas. I think uh, this is, first of all, a wrong announcement. Whatever one might think of shale and whether it's sustainable and will be there for many years to come, which I doubt in the first place. But apart from that, the major question in that regard, I would say, is uh, do we have terminals in order to import liquefied natural gas? These are major investments. You have to construct uh, ports uh, with the capacity to regasify liquid natural gas and then to deliver it to deliver it uh, to the consumer and we have some of those ports in northern europe uh, such as in the baltic countries and uh, uh, in in spain a major one was constructed but for instance for the southern coasts which are mostly used for touristic purposes whether you take the Côte d'Azur or the italian riviera or the adriatic coast Nobody really wanted to have an LNG terminal uh, where people do holidays. So this is, is a major problem. And I don't think that uh, U.S. shale gas, whether produced in North America or whether produced eventually in Poland and Ukraine, as some of U.S. companies are announcing, will really be able to substitute conventional gas flowing from the east to the west. In your view, it is worthwhile to analyze Eurasian geopolitics through the lenses of old Halford Mackinder. Why so? Yeah, because well, there are certain things in history that remain a constant factor, as also uh, German Chancellor Bismarck once said, uh, geography is the constant factor of uh, history, and we simply can't change geography. Uh, so the importance of the Eurasian landmass that Mackinder um, uh, examined and, and discussed in, in around 1900, and that was a long time before uh, we spoke about strategic commodities such as oil, gas, uh, uh, rare metals, etc. So in those days, around 120 years ago, it was just about strategic depths. It was just about arable land. And in those days, the two big powers fighting for that landmass was, was the Tsarist Russia and the British Empire. Today, uh, and also 20, 30 years after um, uh, U.S. Uh, political analyst Brzezinski came uh, across uh, McKinder's theory once again and updated it, Today, we have not only the U.S. and, and uh, uh, Russia and the new Central Asians, we have China, we have Turkey, we have Iran, all those uh, wishing to play a certain role in that strategic landmass because it, uh, of, of its commodities and because whoever controls uh, that pivot area has the hegemony. And uh, that, that's the constant factor. And by the way, also Charles de Gaulle, uh, the late French statesman in the 1960s also pursued that idea, which was uh, later on here and there uh, re, uh, well, uh, taken up again, quoted by, um, by some partisans of uh, the Chirac-Schröder alliance, uh, something like Paris, Berlin, Moscow, that there could be a, a sort of... Uh, Alliance, and we saw that kind of alliance, for instance, 10 years ago during the Iraq war when these three uh, states opposed the Iraq war, for instance.
because of oil interests, uh, the French also, and the Russians. Also definitely because of oil interests. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski. Do you think uh, for him it is a nightmare what is developing between Russia and China? Well, from what I read, uh, I think that all those uh, uh, intelligent U.S. political analysts, and Brzezinski is definitely one of them, Henry Kissinger is another, and so many others, they are not very, uh, amu very much amused by what's going on in antagonizing Russia these days, because uh, it's, it's logic that Russia is pushed more and more uh, turning towards East, uh, which has already been a development, as we discussed beforehand. It's nothing new, but it's, uh, it's uh, enhanced. Yes. Uh, can we also see this between uh, Russia and Iran these days? Yeah, which is interesting because Iran has announced over the last few months several times it can always step in as a gas supplier if Russian gas doesn't flow anymore. But at the same time, we see now and on, on Monday there was an interesting uh, meeting and signing of agreements between high-ranking Iranian and Russian officials uh, to cooperate in the energy sector and to cooperate in the agricultural sector. So. Uh, when the, when Russians stop imports of uh, German apples and Greek grapes and uh, Italian prosciutto, etc., uh, the uh, the Iranians, which also are uh, dispose of uh, of uh, high quality agricultural products, step in next to the Turks. And um, here, uh, I would say the Iran and Russia, who are not really natural allies and who have always uh, well worked together more because of uh, of need uh, than because of love, uh, they are both today in the same situation of being sanctioned by the West, and the Iranians uh, know what that means. And I don't know to which extent, even so, I've always been fairly optimistic about a reopening of contacts with Iran. Uh, but the 24th of November is approaching, and that was the date uh, uh, to either completely lift the sanctions or to continue and uh, to impede any kind of, of trade uh, cooperation between the West and Iran. Uh, one region that is very crucial for energy is the Central Asian uh, region that Pepe Escobar calls Pipelanistan. And... Uh, are China and Russia rather competing with each other there, or are they cooperating? Uh, well, we have uh, both. I think we, we have a kind of pragmatism, and uh, of course you need the, the, the... I mean, you don't build a pipeline just for the next few years, you build a pipeline for a generation and more, so that it really makes sense. And I would say that certain uh, developments are going on in that area of the world, which uh, the frogs in the big European pond simply don't realize because we are so much occupied with our own frog pond. Uh, we don't see, for instance, that um, uh, the, the, the South Asian continent, and I think that uh, many oil and gas producers look even uh, much more into India, Pakistan, which today don't look uh, like uh, interesting markets because of the misery and because of the uh, traumatic political situation we have in a country like Pakistan, for instance. But uh, China is right now a very important partner, market uh, investor. Uh, however, things can dramatically change in China because of demography. Because um, we, we spoke, with, uh, we often refer to the Chinese paradoxon that for the first time in history, a population will grow old before it will start to prosper. So uh, the, uh, the the old Chinese, <laughs> the the overage Chinese population will turn into a big social problem for the Chinese. But then, uh, in return, the Indians, the Pakistanis, and some other countries in South Asia will become more important. And that's also where we see pipelines going not only east, but I would say southeast. Yeah. Another thing that is in the cards um, is a change in the oil pricing and that it takes place in another currency or other currencies uh, than the US dollar, namely r rubles and yuan. What are your thoughts on this? Well, this is a very important development and actually in October 2012, uh, Russia and China announced that they would uh, start 
um, um, using uh, yuan and uh, and ruble instead of the reserve currency dollar in their bilateral trade. Now, so far, that has not become operative. But recently, several Russian companies, among them Rosneft, announced that in September they will start a number of pilot projects in which they will use uh, their uh, currencies instead of uh, the world reserve currency, which is the currency in which we trade all commodities, not only oil and gas, namely the US dollar. And uh, if uh, two major powers, uh, uh, namely Russia and, and, and China, start doing that, that has a much bigger impact than if a country like Libya or Iraq or whoever uh, tries to, to move out of the US dollar. And here, uh, I think this is something that, that should be watched closely because it's not only about using other country, uh, currencies, but it's also about establishing a rating agency that would be run by Russian and Chinese funds. And uh, as we have seen already, and I think in one of the, the articles Pepe Escobar wrote, uh, and, and you mentioned it in some interviews, uh, the BRICS Development Bank as a kind of substitute uh, to World Bank uh, matters, and we see uh, also here a shift of financial services, maybe a shift of financial activities towards the East. And if we may speculate uh, simply for the exercise of, of using our little brain cells, imagine Scotland becomes independent next week. What would that really mean to, to the financial uh, center of London? It would be dramatic. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the next step uh, then... Uh, certainly following in, in, in Barcelona certain uh, de developments. I, I think Europe uh, will be very much occupied with itself once again if, uh, if, if certain events uh, uh, like territorial uh, secession happen uh, this autumn. Uh, so uh, the, the, the real big redesigning of, uh, of centers, of maps is going on in the East. Mm -hmm. Uh, coming to Austria, how vulnerable are Austrian banks vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Ukraine crisis and sanctions uh, towards Russia? They are highly vulnerable. Uh, even so, other big banks uh, are, are more present in absolute figures than, uh, than the three big major Austrian banks. But uh, in proportion to a population of 8 million people, uh, our um, um, economy and our employment uh, sector is much more affected. Um, the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, presented yesterday a report that something like 11,000 um, working places will be affected uh, by a prolonged crisis in Russia. Uh, and the banks are certainly at, uh, uh, affected in, in the first rank. Uh, according to the figures published, uh, if the Russians, for instance, decide um, uh, to, to stop serving certain credits or will, uh, uh, will impose sanctions on, on foreign banks, that would mean a loss of 36 billion euros for Austrian banks. Now, 36 billion euros for, uh, when you compare it to our GDP, which if I recall correctly, turns around 290 billion, this is, this is quite a, uh, a sum. And uh, according to other figures, uh, the, the loss would be even much more higher, uh, namely the double or triple. Mm -hmm. What do you expect for South Stream? Well, South Stream has been frozen in early March, uh, and that was in response to the events on the, on the Crimean Peninsula. Now, South Stream uh, was supposed to start uh, constructing, to be constructed 1st of June. Uh, everything was there 1st of June, the material, the workers, the money. And the European Commission imposed a penalty uh, procedure against uh, Bulgaria, uh, claiming that Bulgarian uh, government companies had uh, violated competition, European competition law when, uh, uh, when doing the tenders uh, for certain projects uh, that I mean, that, that was something that, that, that is one thing. But the other thing uh, that was legally advanced as an argument why South Stream could not start uh, was the fact that other European norms such as unbundling, namely the fact that 
uh, the company that delivers gas and the company that runs the pipeline should be different entities. Now, that concept uh, was advanced uh, at, at, at a fairly late stage, I would say. Uh, now, when you talk to European Commission officials, they will say, no, of course, that was something that we had always discussed with our Russian partners. We had always said that something has to be done about it. But to completely freeze a project uh, two months before it's supposed to be started, nobody can explain to me that that was just because of legal misunderstandings or interpretation. That has to do with political decision making. And uh, the Russian argument is, and I would share that to a certain extent, look at Nord Stream. We built Nord Stream uh, uh, by creating contracts that uh, were bilaterally negotiated between the Germans and the Russians. And a lot of European Union norms were not uh, involved in that. It was uh, treaty law. Uh, now, when it comes to South Stream, the EU now, or the European Commission to be more precise, insists on, uh, on using European Union law to, to, to the extent it exists in that matter. And here I think it's a very legalistic approach uh, that hampers a project that uh, was politically decided and accepted a long time ago. Uh, one final question. We've talked about pipelines and energy policies here. Is this also a dimension of what's going on in Syria and Iraq? Well, uh, you see, the, the, the state of Iraq and uh, the borders between uh, uh, the, the newly created Arab nation states uh, in the aftermath of World War I uh, all followed pipelines. Uh, first, the pipelines were created, then the states uh, got their borders, so to say, to put it in a nutshell. And uh, with the advancing of, of a statehood, of a Kurdish statehood that is pushed even by, by the West now very strongly, we might see uh, new statelets. I, I read recently a report by a major um, analytical group based in London uh, where the, the, the bottom line of their an analysis is well, don't worry about those developments. In the end, it will be even much easier to invest in smaller states and in a liberalized market in smaller states, which, which uh, means uh, destroy the Iraqi National Oil Company and then deal with smaller entities. Um, whether that will come about in such a way, peaceful way, uh, ready to be uh, there for, for investments, I don't know. Uh, but definitely uh, the oil curse has shaped history in the Middle East ever since the 1940s. And do you think this will continue, for example, related to the Levante? Uh, well, in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean um, basin, the so-called Levant Basin, we also have now uh, interesting gas exploration going on in the triangle between Cyprus, uh, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Israel, the and Israelis, Gaza. and Gaza. Yeah, Gaza is also to a certain extent affected. If there were something like a Palestinian uh, state uh, that could claim its economic exclusive zone stretching into the eastern Mediterranean, the gas fields that are now claimed and uh, explored by the Israelis, namely Tamar and Leviathan, uh, definitely, we also have uh, gas uh, reserves more south, which could be claimed by Gaza and more uh, to the east, which with that, which are already claimed by Lebanon. So uh, not only that, uh, I, I have lots of, of, of friends in that region who always said, well, thanks God we don't have oil and gas. Uh, we only have our religious problems and ethnic problems. That's enough. But now uh, the commodity dimension adds uh, to, to the old struggle between different partisans of one God, all of them claiming that they have a right to settle there. Okay, I thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.